Hello, welcome to Bumblebee for today's video on the top 10 repulsive queens from ancient Egypt you never learned about. Number one is context on the missing queens. Lexi de los Santos, a Nat Geographic promoter, perfectly describes the treatment of Egyptian queens. Out of all the ancient civilizations, Egypt was the only one that really valued women, but after their rule, male leaders just erased all memory of these women because they didn't want them to have all that success. But why would ancient men in a culture that respected and revered women still strike them off the record in a fit of primal jealousy when they've been regal. It was best explained in the recent Bumblebee video, Top 10 Messed Up Things That Happened to Women in Ancient Egypt. It's the blame game. In ancient Egypt, pharaohs were supposed to be the human incarnate of the gods, but one thing that the male gods, female gods, and human females all had in common was the truest power, the womb, the ability to create and birth life, Ra's greatest creation. All of mankind came from Ra, the king god, yet any man who sat on the throne as pharaoh, meant to be the incarnate of Ra, was missing that one true power. So what that meant is any time a female pharaoh took the throne, she was more akin to the king god by the Egyptians own definition than the male pharaoh ever could be. Call that a mic drop. Consequently, if the womb wielders had a built in facet of power that you can't regulate, recreate, nor have for yourself, chances are you're going to be pretty snubbed. So if she's also a better ruler than her male counterparts, you're going to be resentful. Unfortunately, this means the documentation of many queens is lost to time. Their stories coming to us in broken pieces of pottery and papyrus, on ancient word of mouth from Greek and Rome, or from unidentified mummies that come and go as the sands blow thanks to the jealousy of mankind. Leader number nine will be Kenti Hase the first. So who was the first woman to rule Egypt? This will be the biggest debate of the video as there are technically three qualifiers. First candidate is Kenti Hase the first. She was born circa 2550-2520 BC and died sometime between 2510 and 2490 BC. The remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within her necropolis until its excavation in the 19th. And since its discovery at Giza, her tomb has intrigued historians and archaeologists alike. The mausoleum is as grand as other pyramids of her predecessors and includes a solar boat, a chapel, granaries, and a water tank. A small structure known as the washing tent of the female king had been built in front of her temple, and here the body was washed and ritually purified prior to being embalmed. Her mastaba is believed to have been the final royal tomb that was constructed at that necropolis, and many scholars believe that it was strongly connected to the pharaohs of the 4th and 5th dynasties. On its granite doorway, her formal title is construed to be the mother of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, holding office as king of Upper and Lower Egypt. In support of the latter title is her image, which is altered to show her in a kingly pose, including the false beard, the royal Uraeus cobra crown, and holding a scepter, one of the many adjustments and additions made up until the 6th century, implying that this pharaoh possibly had continued a role in religion and worship after her death. Kenti may have ruled as a regent for her presumed son, Sahur, possibly in conjunction with Yustarkaf, the founder of the 5th dynasty. However, despite the fact that she was apparently considered an ancestress of the 5th dynasty and was commemorated in the mortuary chapel of Absur at Kenikartes II, her name has never been found in a royal cartouche. Leader number 8 is Mernith. Among ancient Egypt's greatest female leaders was Queen Mernith who had the overwhelming ambition to rule a country, and stopped whoever shared that sentiment. Her name means the beloved niece, the daughter of King Dier, and beloved she seemed to be, until after she died and then the men didn't have to respect her anymore, that is. Even if she wasn't the first woman to rule Egypt, she definitely seemed to be, but if historians wanted to debate endlessly, who am I to stop their fun? She definitely was the first woman to rule anything in known human history, because she was born about 3,000 years ago. Mernith stepped in as regent after her husband's death as their son, Den, was too young to rule at the time. Karakuni, an Egyptologist, said that these women were often used as protectors. Men would put women in high positions to 
keep young male leaders safe and give them time to mature. When a man was ready to take over as pharaoh, the woman in charge would step down. But Bernice was old kingdom Egypt, and when she assumed this tutelage, it was in despite of what religious traditions of the first dynasty decree, that only men were to rule. Despite that, Bernice stood rigidly by her son for a full decade, from 2939 to 2929 BC, until he became one of the most prominent kings of old kingdom Egypt. Despite the fact that there are few records of her name in any tombs, her accomplishments in life, she's still believed to have been a figure of great power and simultaneously respected and despised. Either way, she's one of those pharaohs that was buried alongside 50 live servants. Leader number 7 is Nikokris. The third and most mysterious candidate for the first female king of Egypt is recorded many centuries later in the work of the Egyptian historian Manitho. Her name is Nikokris, and she was believed to have lived around the 22nd century BC, which was towards the end of the 6th dynasty. Some have suggested that Nikokris was the last pharaoh of this dynasty. As Manitho tells us, she built the third pyramid and reigned for 12 years, but the whole third pyramid thing is an absolute disaster if you know anything about ancient Egypt. There's just so much BS around the kings list and the dynasties. We don't know who made it, and every time we think we do, someone else shows up in history and has it attributed to them. So, it's up in the air. Herodotus also mentions Nikokris, but in the colorful context that she had killed hundreds to avenge the Egyptian king, who had been slain by the people in a coup, and who happened to be her brother. The people had given the kingdom to Nikokris to rule after doing so. The story is, is that she had constructed an elaborate underground dining chamber under the guise of it being for her coronation, inviting all those she knew to be responsible for her brother's death as well as anyone who knew of the coup plan but did nothing of it. This includes servants, concubines, officials, priests, the whole shebang. As the banquet progressed, Nikokris, surveying safely from a platform, had her servants open the floodgates and let the flow of the Nile River into the chamber through a concealed pipe, drowning all in attendance. To quote Herodotus, that is all the information I was given about Nikokris, except that afterwards she threw herself in a chamber full of ashes to avoid retribution. Leader number six is Sobanekfru. It's not until the end of the Middle Kingdom that we find for the first time 100% pure clear evidence of a female king. So her name was Sobanekfru and there are about five variations of her name, all harder to say than the last. However, the name Sobanekfru means the beauties of Sobek in reference to the crocodile god. One, that the rulers of the 12th dynasty established a religious and economic center in Fayum 4, where crocodiles were nurtured and worshipped. Queen Sobanekfru rose to power after the death of her brother slash husband Amenhotep the fourth which made her the eighth ruler of Egypt's 12th dynasty and she went on to rule for nearly four years that was a lot of numbers in one sentence so I hope you're keeping up though missing her head in many the queen statues found in Fayum show that she appeared to combine masculine and feminine aspects of regal dress similar to many other female rulers of Egypt she is the last ruler prior to the new kingdom to appear in the offering list found at Abydos and Sakera which does suggest suggests some kind of posthumous verdict that separates her from the kings who followed her with equally short reigns. How Sobanekfru died or where she was buried remains a mystery. Some have suggested that her burial might be in one of the pyramids at Mazgana, but this is very unlikely, as is Amenhat's labyrinth or Herkeopolis, both of which she contributed to. Thus, one of the most powerful women of the early world history remains a mystery. Leader number five is Cleopatra. Everyone knows Cleopatra. There's already been so much written about it, you could drown in it. Yet, we still know next to nothing about her. But thanks to a famous smear campaign against her by, hmm, everyone in ancient times, I can list off a few not so nice details about this queen to fit more into our repulsive theme. If you want to learn more about her life, maybe check out the recent Top 10 Filthy Secrets of Cleopatra That'll Make You Blush video on our channel Bumblebee. Maybe while you're at it, subscribe to The Hive if you want to see more like it. Born in 69 BCE, Cleopatra's seventh Tia Philopater was bred to be a ruler, having come from a long line of royal siblings having children together, which makes the family tree look a lot more like a family ladder when drawn on paper, just instead of like branching out roots. And apparently sharing a bed with a cousin isn't enough, you have to share names too. About 90% of Cleopatra's family was either named Ptolemy or Cleopatra. Every now and then a Bernice or an Arsenio was thrown in there to give us a break. I guess it would make inter-family relations a little bit less weird and more normalized if your dad, uncle, brother, 
brother, half brother, brother, and new husband slash brother all have the same name. Maybe a different Cleopatra who famously married two of her brothers and also killed at least one of them. The other one, she had somebody else do it for. Leader number four is Amos. Amos was the principal wife of Pharaoh Thutmose the first in the 18th dynasty and the mother of Hatshepsut, who went on to become one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. She had many titles, king's great wife, king's sister, hereditary princess, great of praises, and mistress of the two lands. However, it appears she is a rare occurrence of a primary wife not being of royal blood, which would explain why her probable son, Prince Amenmones, was not mentioned in the Theban mortuary chapel of Wadmos, which attests her husband's secondary wife and her sons. The whereabouts of Amos's tomb and mummy remain unknown, likely one of the many lost to pillaging in weird Victorian unwrapping parties. However, Stella found in a defu that once belonged to an official called Yuf remains a testament to her existence. He recorded that the Queen Amos appointed him as an assistant treasurer and entrusted him with the service to a statue of Her Majesty. Amos owes a lot of thanks to her daughter, Hatshepsut, however, for plastering her face everywhere. As you'll learn in the next segment, Hatshepsut dedicated herself as a demigod and so put up many etchings and murals of her divine conception, the image of the god Amun approaching her mother, Amos, or some more compromising images of the two together. Good for Amos catching a god's attention. Leader number three is Hatshepsut. So from mother to daughter, let's talk about this train wreck who was also the most influential and long ruling Egyptian queen and was known to be a great diplomat during her 22 year reign. She is also regarded as the first great woman in recorded history. Hatshepsut was only the second known woman to assume the throne as king of upper and lower Egypt after queen Sobanekfu, whom was the model for this pharaoh as a queen and whom she based many of her decisions upon. Upon Thutmose II's death, the throne was passed to Thutmose III and Hashifsot, who was the aunt and stepmother, acted as regent until simply just taking the crown herself. Like pretty much every Egyptian queen short of Cleopatra, Hattie dressed in men's royal garb, wore a false beard, and created statues of herself with the pharaoh's headdress. During the seventh year of her reign, however, she went even further and asked to be depicted as a man, ordering to be referred to not as a queen, but as a king. Hattie surrounded herself with strong and loyal advisors, her favorite being the royal steward Senemut, who many believe was having an affair with the queen. The evidence for this claim is the fact that Hatshepsut allowed Senemut to place his name and image of himself behind one of the main doors of the Dieser Dessu, which is rare, and, and an unusual share of credit. That and plenty of graffiti made by peasants and workers depict the two in compromising positions. Not kidding, ancient R-rated graffiti. Anyway, Hattie's reign was peaceful, a time where many monuments were erected of her, of a mun who she claimed was her lineage was based off of a Bastet, maybe a few more of her, you know, to be humble. However, after her death, her successor, who was possibly even her own stepson, attempted to erase all record of her, destroyed statues, burnt documents, attempted to remove her presence from Egypt. This effort only half works. While we don't know much as we wish we could, Hatshepsut is still remembered to this day. Leader number two is Nefertiti. This is the queen married to the cult guy who was so hated in Egypt that everyone agreed to ignore that he had ever happened. Unfortunately, it means this beauty had her name tarnished in the process, call it canceled by association. That's why Taylor Swift broke up with the problematic singer guy, Maddie. I think the name alone is worth the breakup. Why are you in your mid thirties, but still going by Maddie? Nefertiti's name can translate to a beautiful woman has arrived and that she had from parents unknown. We haven't figured that part out. A life-size bust of the queen was found in 1912 and is her most famous image and depiction, and it shows she really was a stunner. To the extent it's believed that ancient Egyptians revered her as a fertility goddess embodied. However, other Egyptian art depicts Nefertiti in ways normally only pharaohs are shown. For instance, she's portrayed smiting enemies, such as on a ship, raising her right hand to kill female prisoners, a depiction often seen on male pharaohs. Additionally, the type of helmet-like crown Nefertiti is wearing in the bust is typically reserved for pharaohs or the goddess Tefnut or Hathor. One idea is that after Akhenaten's death, Nefertiti's power and popularity was so great she was able to rule as pharaoh in her own right. Egyptian records mention a figure named Neferen Fatuen, who ruled Egypt for a brief time. Like how actors took stage names, pharaohs actually took throne names and it's speculated this was the throne name for Nefertiti. This means our girl was on the throne for three years. But as you know, after her reign, the Egyptian people tried to wash her away to the best of their abilities. Took Mahan, 
undid Akhenaten's religious reform, Armana became abandoned, and images of Akhenaten and Nefertiti are destroyed. Where leader number one is Aset. You may know her by her Grecian name, however, Isis. She was the queen mother of all gods. Her name quite literally translates to queen of the throne, which is reflected in her headdress, which is sometimes a literal throne. However, sometimes it takes on traits from Hathors or Mutz to represent her assimilation with other women in the pantheon. While she seemingly started as a side figure to her husband Osiris, she was quickly transformed into the queen of the universe and an embodiment of cosmic order. By the Roman period, a set was believed to control fate and linear existence itself. This is accredited to the story of Ra's secret name, where an Aset is able to find out the true name of Ra, something no other god knows, and ultimately makes her his equal, if not more powerful than he. Aset was the sister and wife of the god Osiris, ruler of the underworld. It is said that she and Osiris were in love with each other even within the womb. As he was king of Egypt, Isis was queen, and one who supported her husband and taught the women of Egypt to weave, bake, and brew beer. Set was always angry with this relation, as Isis reigned over the land of Egypt in the wake of the traveling Osiris instead of Set. She was stronger, and he regarded this with jealous eyes as well as the good works of his brother, for his heart was full of evil and he loved warfare better than peace. The queens frustrated his wicked designs, so he sought in vain to prevail in battle against her and plotted to overcome Osiris by Gal. This is how the famous story of Osiris' death, Horus' birth, and the grieving of Set prevails as one of Egypt's most famous stories. Set tricks Osiris into the coffin, which he tosses in the Nile. The grieving of Set refused to accept this and search far and wide as a fugitive, birthing their son Horus on the journey. When she finds a coffin, she returns it to Egypt. Unfortunately, Set finds it hidden again and dismembers Osiris, scattering the pieces. Isis still refuses to relent. She finds the pieces and entombs them. Anubis, with the assistance of Thoth and Horus, united the severed portions of the body of Osiris, which they wrapped in linen bandage. Thus, the origin of the mummy form of the god. Osiris then became the judge and king of the dead, residing in the underworld, as Isis remained with Horus on the above. Thanks once again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Take some time to like and subscribe to see more content. I'll see you around.